March 19, Morgan Stand. Union General James D. Morgan's division of the 14th Corps deployed south of the Goldsboro Road about 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday, March 19, 1865. On reaching their position, the soldiers in Morgan's three brigades immediately began to build field fortifications from logs, branches, and shovelfuls of muddy soil to protect themselves from enemy bullets. About 2.45 p.m., the Confederates north of the Goldsboro Road, commanded by General William J. Hardy, launched an attack against Union General William P. Carlin's division of the 14th Corps and routed it. Some of Carlin's troops fled through Morgan's line in a rapid and disorganized retreat, wrote General John G. Mitchell, whose brigade held the left of Morgan's line. A few of the panic-stricken men paused long enough to warn Mitchell's troops that the enemy would surround them if they remained in their present position. Most of Mitchell's men ignored their warnings and stayed put. To guard against an attack on his left flank, Mitchell ordered two of his regiments to form a line facing north and at a right angle to Morgan's main line, which faced east toward the Confederates of Robert Hoke's division. Morgan's position was hemmed in by Southern troops along his front and left flank and by an all but impassable swamp on his right flank. A few hundred yards behind Morgan's main line, his reserve brigade, commanded by General Benjamin D. Fearing, prepared to move out in support of Carlin's division. Just then, General Jefferson C. Davis, the commander of the 14th Corps, galloped up and ordered Fearing to push his brigade as rapidly as possible to the Goldsboro Road, where the Confederates were forming for an assault against the rear of Morgan's position. Fearing's onrushing troops soon collided with a Confederate line of battle and drove it across the Goldsboro Road. Meanwhile, Confederate soldiers of the Army of Tennessee advanced on Fearing's right flank, but Fearing mistook them for Carlin's men and ordered his soldiers to hold their fire. Moments later, the Confederates unleashed a devastating volley at point-blank range. Among the northern wounded was General Fearing, who lost his right thumb and forefinger to a southern mini ball. The Confederates drove back Fearing's brigade for several hundred yards. Although Fearing's spoiling attack ended in retreat, it disrupted the Confederate main assault. At four o'clock p.m., as Fearing was falling back, General Braxton Bragg gave the order for Hoke's division to attack Morgan's position more than an hour after the assault should have begun. Bragg never explained why he failed to attack when ordered, but whatever the reason may have been, the delay gave Morgan's division invaluable time to prepare for the Confederate onslaught. Once the order was given, Hoke's men struck Morgan's line hard. The North Carolina troops commanded by Lieutenant Colonel John Douglas Taylor, nicknamed the Red Infantry because of the red trim on their artillerymen's uniforms, managed to drive off the Union soldiers manning the log works on their front. But the Northerners soon rallied and subjected the Tar Heels to a deadly fire. Of the 267 officers and men that Taylor brought into the fight, 152 were killed, wounded, or captured, a casualty rate of 57%. Taylor himself was severely wounded, and his shattered left arm had to be amputated. The Confederates fell back and reformed for another assault. According to Captain Herman Lund, the commander of the 16th Illinois, the Confederates charged with redoubled fury, but Morgan's men inflicted a terrible loss and repulsing them for the second time. Lund's regiment was part of General William Vandiver's brigade, which held the right of Morgan's line. After the second Confederate attack, Vandiver's men were low on ammunition, so the regimental commanders hastily conferred and decided they had better attack the Confederates, while the men still had a few rounds left in their cartridge boxes. The officers gave the order to charge. The men fought with clubbed rifles and fixed bayonets in a swampy thicket filled with smoke. The hand-to-hand -hand struggle was sharp but brief. The Union troops drove Hoke's men back to their entrenchments. No sooner did Vandiver's men return to their log works than bullets from their rear began to zip past. After driving off Fearing's brigade, Confederate soldiers belonging to the Army of Tennessee had crept into the rear of Morgan's position. They exchanged a few volleys with Morgan's troops, and then the Union soldiers began to wave their hats and handkerchiefs. Thinking that the Yankees wanted to surrender, the Confederates told them to drop their weapons and come forward. But much to their surprise, the Union soldiers called on the rebels to surrender. 
Unknown to the Confederates, the Northerners were stalling for time, and their diversion soon paid off. Meanwhile, General Davis, the 14th Corps commander, sent General William Cogswell's 20th Corps Brigade into the fight. Cogswell's regiment struck the Confederates from the rear, while Vandiver's men attacked them from the front. The Southerners, who could do so, fell back across the Goldsboro Road. Though attacked from the front, left, and rear, Morgan's line had held. A soldier in the 34th Illinois later wrote that he and his comrades in Morgan's division had seen nothing in four years of army life to compare with that 19th of March at Bentonville.